Good morning. There are four seats up here. If you guys in the back want to come up, there's no reason these can stay empty. So that beachcombing story, I just want to make it clear that I am the world's greatest beachcomber because of that. <laughs> Give me your stories and see if you can beat me, but I think I win. Okay, so I'm a set decorator in the film business and the TV business. I'll just briefly explain what that is, uh, and I'll briefly explain how I came to do that. And then uh, I'm going to use pictures from The Revenant to show what I do uh, specifically. Uh, and putting together this talk, I had to think about, well, where did it start? Like, how far back can I go? And my parents are here. They can't believe this. This, something like this I received when I was seven years old. It's a, it's a marionette stage that you put on your table. And I remember playing with marionettes and being fascinated with the whole concept of on stage and off stage. And I don't know if that's significant, but I know it was a seed and it made me think about performance. And I loved performance and magic tricks. I had a, I had a, a my dresser was pants, sweaters, shirts, socks, magic. Absolutely. I was never good at it, but I really liked it. The first movie set I ever saw was 57th and Granville. This is The Changeling with George C. Scott. My mom took me there. I remember being across the street and looking at the, the fake rock wall, being really impressed, you know, tapping it. It's wood. They tricked me. So well done. I love that sort of thing. And I was always fascinated by this. Um, Throughout university, I was always distracted by this sort of thing. What is going on? I've got to have a look. What's, what are they doing? What are those guys doing? What is all that equipment? And while if I'm pursuing an unfulfilling career, or an unfulfilling uh, <laughs> degree in English literature, I pursued uh, at UBC, I sort of got into working on rock videos, and, which were small and local at the time, and I conned my way onto a local production, this one, Impolite, which is a small Vancouver production. I was a PA, I was parking trucks the first day, but working for no money. But I noticed these other people working on the film, and I was like, who are those guys? And so I swear, by lunch of the first day, I joined the art department. And I started helping them with whatever they want to do, moving stuff around, and I really, really got into it. And then, this is sort of blurry, but this is a, a sort of snapshot of the things that I had to do over the years. Some of it is re super rewarding, some of it is really just a paycheck. Um, but it's a huge range. There's action, horror, romance, all ridiculous stuff in there, uh, some really fun stuff. Sometimes the final product, product isn't that great, but some of the sets inside are fantastic, and I really enjoy it. Um, I was working on a paycheck-type movie, uh, and uh, I, one of the things I created was a junkyard out of uh, in an empty space, completely empty space. We made an enormous junkyard, 200 crushed cars and piles of tires and a Quonset hut. And when the shooting crew showed up, I heard some of the crew members say, God, I didn't know there was a junkyard here. I thought, <laughs> got it. <laughs> Uh, so during this, I was lucky enough to work with this man, Jim Erickson, who I would consider my mentor. Jim is, uh, I think I did five movies with him, including a couple overseas. Jim recently retired when he won an Oscar for Lincoln, uh, which well deserved. And um, his resume is pretty good. I think everything on here is period, except for Independence Day, because Jim needs a paycheck too. Uh, <laughs> but that's his specialty. and. Uh, Interestingly, I found out recently that five of, so I was Jim's assistant, but five of Jim's former assistants have gone on to be Oscar nominees. So the answer is listen to Jim. Um, Jim said, read this book. And uh, I don't, has anybody seen the movie or read the book? I don't know. I'll, I'll just give you a brief explanation. So it's a true story. This is the book, uh, The Revenant. It's a true story about a man named Hugh Glass in the 1820s. Uh, he was a fur trapper in the upper Missouri area. This is the Lewis and Clark map, famous. There was no roads at the time. Everything was done by rivers. But basically, it takes place in the dead center in the top there where the Yellowstone and the um, Missouri River sort of uh, meet. The, uh, the story is he was a fur trapper. He was attacked by a grizzly bear sort of left for dead by his uh, compatriots, and uh, before they left him, they robbed him of his knife and his gun, and it's a story of revenge. Uh, and uh, so Jack uh, Fisk was the guy who uh, called Jim. Jim said, well, I'm retired, so called second string Hamish, and I was happy to take the call. I met Jack at the Sutton Place Hotel for a 30-minute interview. 
and we ended up talking for about two and a half hours. We really saw eye to eye on a lot of things. As he says he's very hands-on. I include this picture because you can see he's missing his left index finger, uh, which he lost in a painting accident, and that shows you his commitment. But he's a really interesting guy and great resume. He always said that he was a very hands-on guy. I said, Jack, you're 95% of your hands-on. You're not all there. <laughs> Uh, he's, a, he's a friend of Terrence Malick and David Lynch. He works closely with those guys. Most of Terrence Malick's films and three of these films he did with, oh, I put the new world in twice. Uh, three of these films he did with Jim, including There Will Be Blood. Uh, but Jack called me and said, let's do this movie and let's work for this guy. This is Alejandro Gonzalez Inarritu, but we call him AGI to avoid any embarrassing mispronunciation. <laughs> <laughs> and he accepted that. A very talented, brilliant, and demanding director. Uh, and uh, we, most of this film we shot in Alberta. And um, the way Alejandro shoots uh, with his director of photography, Chivo, or Emmanuel Lubeski, is a, a very fluid camera. A camera can go anywhere at any time. Uh, I didn't want to be caught out, so my mandate to myself was, okay, well, whatever I do, I have to give him 1822 all the time. And if I could just do that and make it look right, I'll be covered. 1822 is the era. Is the, is the year that we were in. And so for me, that's really important that everything I put in is accurate to that time. That's really specific to what I talk about, but um, he's, he's got other issues. I gotta make sure that everything in the, in the movie is, is period correct. Uh, it was notoriously a grueling shoot. This is the camera department trying to get into a certain spot to, to shoot uh, a scene. It was, it was tough for the crew. It was definitely tough for the actors. This is, uh, everything's heavy, everything's cold, everything's wet, and uh, yeah, uh, one, of the, one of the important things that I had to maintain, I worked closely with the props department, so the, I should explain that the set, de okay, so the production designer hires the set decorator, which is me, and the production designer, is in, Jack, is in, in, look, in charge of the entire look of the movie, so he hires the construction department, the paint department, the art department to do the drawings, and I'm in charge of populating the set with all the items that make it look right. The props department specifically deal with stuff that the actors handle, and in this case, the, this movie, uh, there was a big gray area, very fuzzy area with that, because a lot of my stuff became props, and it was important that everything looked right and consistent for the movie. So it starts with research. This is all pre-photography, this movie, so we had to go to the paintings of Miller, Bodmer, and Caitlin, were three artists at the time that covered this part of the world, and we studied these intimately, every, every detail we could get out of these. Also the journals and, and diaries of trappers, uh, a lot of those are saved, and we consulted with museums in Minnesota and Missouri, uh, North Dakota, to get it right. The script called for a boat. They had to, this was the, the era, the reason these people were out there was for the fur. It was all about, this is pre-gold rush, the fur was the gold, that's the reason they were out there. That was the only reason they were out there. And so they moved the fur back to St. Louis on these boats called flat boats. So the script called for a flat boat. So Jack builds a model based on some, some illustrations. The guard department comes up with a drawing. Construction builds it, paint, paints it, and then I cover it with my stuff. Uh, this is, it looks even better when you have actors on it. Now this boat actually had a 400 horsepower jet engine hidden inside. <laughs> <laughs> so that we were able to go back up to the upstream and start again. <laughs> uh, but uh, there's details on that boat that you can't see in this image, but everything is period correct. The rope is hemp rope. The, the cannon I ordered from a place down in the south. Uh, we had hand forged hooks all over the boat and uh, the fur bales, which I can tell you about later, which is the reason they were there. It looked pretty good. Any photographs that are good like this were taken by my friend Kim French, who was our stills photographer on the movie. Uh, and she, she made everything look better. This is when they're abandoning the boat, if you haven't seen the movie. I hope I'm not giving it away, but I encourage you to see it. This is during the attack. And again, this is a scene where they cut the lines and they take off and to get back to one, just fire up the engine and bring it back. Don't film that part. Uh, this is our guys, guys on the river there. I'm gonna stand back a bit. So, getting into the, some of the details, this is what I've gotta do. The, the, the parts, the things that they use, tarps, ropes, hooks, leather, satchels, gunpowder, lead, all that stuff's gotta look right. So, we worked on recipes and formulas to age canvas and to make it look exactly, you know, um, it was able to hold up to a, a close-up with a 14 millimeter high, uh, high definition camera. Waxes, linseed oil, all sorts of different combinations. I even worked on um, 
really specifically getting some mildew effect because um, you just never know when the camera's going to be right there by someone's face. So it was important to me. Again, possibility bags. This is what a trapper always had with them. This was gunpowder, flint and steel, all that sort of stuff. These things always had to look used and worn. As Alejandro said, they must look chitty. And uh, the, uh, you know, things, the, the aging on these things would actually wear off and they would start to look new again and we're grinding them again with <laughs> shoe polish and uh, oxidizers, anything to make sure that it looked like it was a real worn out thing. So one of the things Alejandro said was important was to, to reflect the industry, the reason they were there, which is quite harsh, but it is the trapping, gutting, skinning, drying, and packing of beaver pelts. It's a real industry, and to that end, in the, in the opening scene, the trapper's camp that gets attacked, I had to create a butchering area. Now, we're not going to use real beavers, so we used styrofoam uh, taxidermy molds, and then my talented crew started to study images, really disgusting images, of beavers getting gutted and stuff like that, and we worked on creating the image, the, the illusion that this was really happening. Uh, it starts with latex, I don't want to get too specific, it starts with latex and threads, and we came up with different methods to, to make it work, and it started to come together. And, you know, I know it's the morning, I'm sorry, but I assure you, <laughs> I assure you it's all fake, mostly fake. And, uh, yeah, so, but, I mean, that's what it was. That's what these guys did, and, and that was their business. And so, and this is Tom walking through the set. So, so the, the idea of this was to, to convey that um, the, the, the value, I mean, a stack of furs this high was worth a man's uh, year's wages. So it was something they protected, and they wanted to make sure that they were able to... Uh, get it back to St. Louis and get paid. A lot of these guys didn't make money because they lost it or got attacked. This poor woman here, she had to scrape that beaver pelt for about four days because the scene took so long. Um, these are some of the, just uh, some of the details. I had a tinsmith in um, Minnesota, I think, create some, uh, some period correct tins for me just for close-ups and stuff like that. So this fellow here, in the middle, you can see the packed bale. And to create that image, or that, sorry, to create that, that illusion of that many bales, uh, that many furs packed in a bale that these guys were losing and, and trying to stash and trying to protect, we had to come up with a, a method without actually, I mean, that's thousands of furs. I, I couldn't do that. I couldn't afford it. I didn't have the time. So we came up with this little trick. Uh, this is sort of giving it away, but whatever. <laughs> the movie's over. So we, we came up with these layers like this, and then with the talented paint department, we were able to make it look like actual bales uh, of fur that were actually only an inch deep, but you get the idea. The, just a little fur trade nerdiness here, that, that big bale in the middle is a, called a fort bale. The other ones are, are camp bales that they make in the camp. They take them back to the fort, where they get resorted, regraded, repacked, pressed really hard, tight, and sent to St. Louis and eventually onto Europe. And these bales became our lives, they were everywhere. So by necessity, this was a very hands-on show. Normally, the camera shows up, I hand off the set, I move on to the next one. But um, the necessity of this movie, the way the director worked, the way the director of photography worked, and the way Jack worked, I was always there. Got away when I could to get to the next set, but um, this is the picture you saw earlier. So literally standing in an icy river trying to imagine myself catching a fish. Uh, and I found myself in the river a couple times. This is me, for some reason, burying an elk. Uh, <laughs> This was a prologue that we never used in the movie, but Jack was always there with me. He's, he uh, truly is a hands-on guy. We were very proud of our uh, axes. We always had our axes with us. We always had, uh, you know, in other movies I would have a color swatch with me and this <laughs> knife on my belt. But, uh, you know, you gotta change. So, you know, a romantic movie, I'm studying sort of flowers and paintings and stuff like that, and a horror movie, I'm into something else. This, this was certainly the most fascinating to to be involved with for all the research. We shot the bear attack scene in Squamish about two years ago right now. It was really rainy and uh, it was a lot of fun <laughs> if you're wearing the right gear. But um, uh, I, I think I, I, was, I was skeptical at the time. I don't know if you guys know how they did it, but it was some blue suits and some wires and cables and stuff like that. I remember standing in the rain going, I don't know if this is going to work, but I was very happy with the result and throwing Leo around. Now, remember, I liked marionettes. Remember I said, 
the world's most expensive marionette right there. <laughs> he was on cables getting thrown around for a couple days. And everybody gets a coffee break. This is uh, <laughs> fake, of course. <laughs> Uh, so more research. We had to do a fort. This is where, after he gets attacked, he's trying to get back to the fort. So we had to create a fort. Um, and uh, the First Nations would, of different tribes would uh, gather around the forts, and actually even warring tribes would uh, um, declare a truce so that they could get the trade. Trade was very important. Uh, it's all the stuff you learned about, the blankets, the beads, the alcohol, the uh, gunpowder, all that sort of stuff. Uh, and so we decided the fort walls uh, kept everything was within the fort walls and within the fort we had five or six structures that we pre-built. Uh, some of them we pre-built. This is Henry the, Henry's house. This is the captain of the fur trade. Uh, sorry, captain of the fur trading company in our movie uh, played by Domino Gleason. So we built it in the studio and then brought it to location and started to assemble it. Now normally we, obviously we had a paint department helping us age the whole thing, but the weather also helped us quite a bit. Uh, this was in the Spray Lakes area north of Canmore. Beautiful, beautiful spot. And uh, we started to assemble it, and after the boards go on and the weather comes, it starts to start to look like a real thing. I can't say enough about painters in our industry. They really save us. Uh, and then I start to bring in my items, and it starts to look like a real thing. Obviously, we're not even started. We've got to get actors in there. We've got to get the little props in there, stuff like that. Um, this is a Hudson's Bay photograph, uh, but this is technology uh, that existed 100 years earlier. This is a fur press. This is, they would get the dried furs and they would put them and cram them down and then bind them together and wrap them up. And we, I love this image. So I just basically, right off this image, went, okay, let's, how tall are those guys? Okay, let's build one. We built one on, in, the, in the shop, all rough hewn, made it, made it look real. And then the painters went and did a number on it. And this is it. Uh, in the set, again, without any actors yet or uh, any of the stuff that makes it look better. We did a, a saw pit, uh, which is pretty common. You know, you get your timbers and you would create your lumber on site. And I, this is me making a point, I think. Uh, it works, you can use it. And uh, uh, it, was, it was lots of fun. We had, um, we, so we had Henry's house, we had a trading house, we had a bunk house, we had a mess hall, we had a blacksmith shop, we had a butchering area, we had the lumber pit, we had a carpentry section, and we had a stable. And so all that and all the actors and extras that go with that, a lot of activity when we were filming. The, uh, and I think it looked pretty good in the end. Uh, where everybody was really happy. Now I want to talk about this flag. This is a little obsessive set decorator, uh, <laughs> taking a note from Jim Erickson. So 1822, the flag is a 26 star flag and it would have been hand sewn. So what did I do? I ordered wool from England. I had it brought to Vancouver. I had it hand dyed to my specifications and I had a lady in Surrey hand sew the entire flag. Every star was hand cut and every star was hand sewn. Uh, the grommets were hand sewn. Every star specifically rotated on its axis. They weren't oriented up and down, which is correct. I consulted with a, of course, there's a flag guy, and I found him. <laughs> but the, the reason I do that is because Alejandro shows up with Chivo and puts a camera on a 50 foot techno crane, and he sends that crane to the top of the flagpole. Well, I know you're good. Go ahead. It's all, it's all, uh, it's all correct. I don't have to apologize for anything. And uh, again, Kim's French, Kim French's pictures make it look like they were really disgusting areas, actually, the fort, open latrines. There was um, obviously gut piles everywhere. Actually, Hugh Glass's job, he wasn't a trapper. He was a hunter. These guys all had to eat. So some people just trapped. Some people just hunted. Some people just got firewood. Uh, some people just cooked. So there was lots of jobs to be done. But it, you read about the journals. It was just awful. One story, I don't know how much time we have. But I remember reading one story about these, the guys on the on the Palisades up top um, being hungry and there was enough uh, native activity outside that they didn't want to leave the fort walls. And they had um, uh, grappling hooks on ropes with uh, meat on the end and they were fishing for wolves. So the wolves would come up to the edge of the fort and they would hook one. And can you imagine how angry a wolf would be on the end of a rope? And then after they got it halfway up, they would shoot it, haul it over and eat it. So yeah, pretty rough times. But uh, I had 30 teepees set up outside the, uh, outside the camp and everyone was decorated with full detail because again, the roaming camera, I never knew. And sure enough, one day Alejandro went over with the camera and started uh, getting people to do some uh, out, out of the walls uh, activity outside the walls trading. 
I like this picture because it shows our camera operator, Scott Sakamoto, with a <laughs> very modern piece of equipment, the Steadicam, and right behind him is 200 years ago. Uh, and this is uh, some shots of uh, Leo coming into the fort. This is, uh, this is a shot of my bales. No, it's a shot of him. <laughs> like, like this image, people say, that's a picture of Leonardo DiCaprio. I think it's a picture of a hook. Uh, a period correct hook. Uh, so Henry's house was one of the one of the real sets I got to do was the interior, and I and whenever the weather got bad, I would spend time in here, uh, uh, thinking about what I was about to do and, and trying to make it a, a real space because we had some scenes in there, some tense scenes. So after the painters were done, I started to bring my stuff in, and uh, I would retreat in there. And the only real way I call it method dressing, but the only real way is to just sit in there, sit in his bed, read a book. You know, where's the water? Where do I? You know, how, fire should firewood should be close to the fire, all that sort of stuff. And you actually have to sort of live in there a bit, for me, to, to make it work. And, uh, and also work with the colors. Make sure, you know, a little bit of color, not too much. Don't want uh, anything too shocking. I'd, look, I'd photograph it every day, go back to my hotel, and then look at it and go, oh, that, that looks awful. Then try again the next day, move something else on. But I started to put some details in. Again, like the flag, you know, you never know when they're going to do some macro shots. I had a calligrapher in Calgary. I found someone that was able to transpose some original letters onto some paper that I was able to age with tea and potassium permanganate and make it look like it had been worn. Letters correspondence from Henry to his bosses. And, uh, you know, you never know if that's going to make it into the movie. But it's still my job, and, and if I waited to see if it made it into the movie, I wouldn't get out of bed because it, it often ends up on the cutting room floor. But my job is to make sure when the director and the actor shows up, it's all good for them. They, you, could, you don't have to worry about, you're in that space, you can take it from here. You don't have to uh, avoid certain areas. And so the details are really, this is, I remember sitting here one day, just getting right down into the details. And through the magic of eBay, I was actually able to get some real letters uh, from 1822 and stuff them in there so Alejandro could see them. I actually had a, uh, had a journal or a, a ledger book made. Everything was done by the debits and credits in those days. There was no money out on the, out on the frontier. So a uh, ledger book that was uh, really important. So again, so when this guy sits down, I don't have to apologize and you do not want to get in trouble with him because um, you'll hear about it. And, uh, and again, when he sits down with uh, an actor, they can get going. And the actor looks around and goes, oh, this is great. And, the, and he doesn't have to back out of the character, he can go forward. So another set we did was a, a different tribe, a Mandan tribe, which were an agrarian um, First Nations group. And they, uh, not a successful one, they actually didn't end up doing too well. They were more farmers than warriors, which didn't work in those days. But um, the earthen huts, uh, we wanted to have a scene with these earthen huts. So it starts with a model, quite simply in the office, and then we built them for real. Um, and then I added my revenant layer of gore and mud and, and uh, had our people, now there was, again, there was a lot of detail you didn't see in the movie, but I know that the director and the actors and the DP saw all this and those are the guys that hire me. So it's important to get it right for those guys. This is Tom walking through it. And it's a fake dead horse, I assure you. Um, one of the sets was this trade room, very important room. Didn't really see a lot of it in the movie. This is where Leo's explaining is actually going to go after this guy, but so we shot it close to the window. But um, uh, that was a lot of fun because uh, you really got to understand what it was people wanted. They wanted, some people just wanted gunpowder, some people just wanted alcohol, some people wanted the beads. Uh, fascinating, fascinating to get into that. And this was a trade box. Uh, that was carried on the trail. If you wanted to do any trading on the trail, you'd pop this open and say, would, would you like any of this stuff? Uh, tobacco, pipes, beads, all that sort of stuff. We good? Okay, I'll go quickly. Uh, dream sequence is a photograph of a, uh, of a um, pile of buffalo skulls. I think it was in Saskatoon for, for um, fertilizer. At this point, the fur was used for something else. Alejandro wanted this in the dream sequence. There's no way I'm going to get that many buffalo skulls, but I can get you 10. We'll make a mold. We'll repeat the mold, build it on a two-sided pyramid, build it in the stage, and then move it to the location. It works. 
the bottom four feet are actually cow, real cow skulls. I got some, some farmers and then the painters tied that together and it looked really good at night. Uh, we had a, another dream sequence, a church. Sometimes it starts as simple as a drawing like this and then um, they uh, made it out of foam. There wasn't a lot of set dressing, I think the bell maybe. Um, but it looked pretty good. We just sat it right down amongst the trees. This is a day uh, I got in a bit of trouble because the blood on the snow was not holding up. Um, I was working with the special effects guys. Normally I don't do blood, but I became part of the blood crew. Uh, so I started to experiment with jello and, and you know, fake blood when you put it in snow turns pink, so you have to be careful uh, what you do. I was actually at an ice cream store one night and I was fixating a little too much on the, <laughs> perhaps this could work. Uh, but often we're hiding in the bushes behind, uh, watching it all happen. It was a great experience. It was really tough. Uh, my wife is here was very kind to let me go to Calgary for eight months to do this. Um, and it was, uh, it was very tough, but I knew it was uh, sort of a life-changing experience. This is the last day of shooting. Sometimes you gotta burn what you love. We built this uh, for a dream, another dream sequence or a flashback. And again, when Kim takes the pictures, it's, uh, it's a lot better. Anyways, it was a great experience. I was happy uh, to have met Jack and work with him. I just can't say enough about the guy. And we're really happy with the results. And, you know, it went on to again garner uh, 12 nominations, which including every technical category, all my buddies, and uh, I was really happy with the results. That's it. I get to start with one question, and it's one that, that sort of, I don't know if anybody wanted to ask this one or not, but how did you know that that was the same piece of the boat 2,500 miles away and 10 years later? <laughs> That's a good question. My favorite beachcombing question. Uh, the boat I was on was a, a, somebody else's custom race boat, and they only made one of these. It was the, the part that actually came off was a, it's like a spinnaker pole. It's called a jockey pole. It's about six feet long, and it has a logo on it uh, by the company that made it, a company in New Zealand. And when I pulled it, I was like, oh, "Isn't this cool piece of kit? It must be off some boat. We lost one like this years ago." I never thought about it again, but I kept it with me because it's carbon fiber and it's cool and it was light and I could bring it with me, camping, propping up the tent. So I got back and I told my friend Brian who was on the boat and he sent me uh, a, an email chain that he got onto asking for the original CAD drawings from the boat. He sent me the CAD drawing, I printed it out and it's 1,042 millimeters long with 540 millimeters of kill and I printed it out and I looked at mine and it's it, it's the same piece. It's insane. I don't even want to think about how that happened, but... Yeah. <laughs> Do you think he's into the details? <laughs> Who has a question? Oh, I can start right up here. Great talk, thank, thank you. you. And I did see the film, and it was fantastic. I'm wondering, as a creator, um, this film was very high budget, and I'm wondering, have you worked on, you know, smaller budget films, and What's it like, what's the creative process like and the difference when you don't have, let's say, the money to, you know, source out a flag expert or, right, you know, right. is, is it different? Well, you pick and choose your battles, that's for sure. I mean, this one, I, I had a lot of money. I didn't have a lot of time and not a lot of labor. Uh, and Alberta, while the guys that I worked with in Alberta were good, they weren't very um, deep in experience. So I actually had to bring some Vancouver guys with me for some of the details. So those guys that you saw building the fake beavers. So uh, as long as, you know, if I, I've worked on really small movies, and as long as everybody's on the same page and we realize that we only have so much money, then we pick where we're going to spend our money and where we're going to save it. You know, it's, let's do the scene in the car. The car's cheap. We'll just shoot that and then we'll save the money and put it somewhere else. Uh, in this one, but like anything, I break down this, the script and I break it down into sets and then each set I break down to what I think I'm going to need in that set and then put numbers to that and just work off of that. My budget for this was over a million dollars just for my department, so, yeah. You want to talk about the candles? Yeah, so the candles. So I, if you did, I didn't see it here, but in the, in the movie, there's a scene in the, this whole entire movie was shot with natural light. That was a, a mandate of Chivo's. And so uh, it was really just sunlight, moonlight, and firelight. So in the, um, in the bunkhouse, uh, the mess hall, we had this scene, uh, so new, two scenes, New Year's Eve scene and another scene, and we needed candles to light the set. Well, candles give a, not a lot of light, so I had a company in Vancouver make some custom candles for me. BC Wicks and Wax made some beeswax candles for me. 
uh, single wick candles, double wick candles, triple wick candles, and five wick candles, which burn very quickly. And I had uh, about $5,000 worth of candles that we rotated through. And of course, if you know anything about continuity, I'd have to have all candles at different heights so that we could swap them out so that they don't change heights within the scene. <laughs> And then additionally, because these candles would have been made with tallow and wax and whatever was available at the fort or in St. Louis, then there would have been variations in the color, so they couldn't look all the same. So I had to make sure that they, were, they looked different as well. So, yeah, Question back here, anybody? Oh. Are movies ruined for you? <laughs> Some, sometimes, yeah. Like when you watch. Yeah. No, I enjoy, I really enjoy, I still go to movies, I still uh, enjoy it, but I do get distracted. Uh, I saw Deepwater Horizon the other day, which I was very impressed with, and I was thinking, how did you guys do that? <laughs> so that, where would I have got that? Mm. I did do an oil rig for Superman, which never made it into the movie, and I know how hard that was. So, yeah, it can, it, they can be ruined for me, but most of the time I can just enjoy it like everybody else. Uh, Oh yeah, the first time I saw The Revenant, I, I, I was not in the right mindset. There was mistakes in there that you guys don't know about, but it just drove me insane. Like, really, uh, I, I gotta settle down on that stuff, but it, it, you can get obsessive and not know when to let it go, so yeah. Tell us about a mistake. Oh. Uh, <laughs> okay. A footprint here and there. Okay, <laughs> another question back here. Go ahead. Uh, Hi, just following up on that, with virtual reality coming and there's, I guess, already a few movies with that. Yeah. How are you going to deal with that when the, the viewer can just go around at all angles and stuff like that? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, the Revenant, you know, the, there was no, I mean, there was a couple spots where you couldn't take the camera, where the trucks were hiding and stuff like that. But other than that, it was good to go 360. Uh, and, which was a, a tall order, but everybody was doing it, so we, we decided we were going to go ahead with that. But yeah, I don't, I don't know what's going to happen. You know, when CG uh, became a big thing in movies, you know, a lot of us in the set decoration department were like, well, there's our jobs gone. Not the case at all. Uh, it's still really expensive to create CG, so we, we work together and we have dividing lines and stuff like that. Got time for one more question. Oh, <laughs> one, one times four. Oh. Who, who has a quick Maybe question? Maybe it's the same question. Same question, different question, and we'll, work, we'll get to it. Hi, I'm wondering how do you decide how many of something to use, especially the larger scale items? Like you mentioned that you have 30 TPs in a scene. Mm -hmm. So in terms of like the camera depth, like how do you know? Right. How do you judge that? So that works with a plan and a concept illustration. And we just, you know, when we do survey, we do technical surveys and we stand up there with a lens and we look and we, we decide, oh, that area, we can park the trucks back there. We'll never go back there. There's nothing we want to see back there. Then they change their mind. But... <laughs> But we do, and I really drill down on some of the details on that stuff, because a teepee actually has about a ton of wood in it, if you, if you, if you can believe it. I certainly figured that out. And so they don't move that easily. Uh, so, and they also get frozen into the ground. So we had to lock down on a lot of stuff where that was going to be. But, you know, you get down and you look and you go, oh, well, why put those two right in line? Why don't you just, you know, you get a little more that way. So always walking around looking at angles. Yeah. Okay, so who has the killer question? Because this will be the last one. Who's got the best question? <laughs> Standing. Oh, I'll try this one. Okay. Just wondering, how big is the team that you work with, and is your ability to delegate critical to your success? Yes, good question. Because obviously you can't do it all yourself. Yeah, so yeah, you that's a good question. I, I am just a representative. I, I'm in charge, but I couldn't do it without my guys. And sometimes I take work uh, that I don't want to do because they need to work and I owe it to them sort of thing. So. Um, uh, depending on the movie, uh, it works. I, I am the decorator. I have an assistant decorator. I have a couple of buyers sourcing stuff and helping get stuff made. I have a lead dresser. I have up to a dozen or two dozen set dressers actually installing all this stuff. Drivers, uh, electrician, no electrician on the Revenant. That was good. Uh, <laughs> But uh, the team can get quite large. Uh, I did a, a forgettable movie a couple of years ago coming out called Monster Trucks. And at one point I had 25 ton trucks around the lower mainland moving around. 
uh, covering all the sets. And oh, most importantly, my coordinator, she, um, Linda, she's the hub of our department, and she pay, makes sure everything gets paid and delivered, and, and she is the absolute core, and she came with me to Calgary. And uh, I'd come in covered in mud and blood, and she'd go, okay, well, here's what's happening, and I'd head off again. And so, yeah, it's a bit, my crew is very important. Some movies are so small that I can only have two set dressers and one buyer and me an assistant sort of thing, so. So how many people would la like to ask him, how can you work on his team? <laughs>